welcome. I'm so glad we're able to worship together today. This week we begin a new sermon series entitled Unmentionables. And we start with the story of David on his roof. As we prepare to hear God's word, let us calm our hearts and our minds to do so.
Let us pray. Lord, as your word is proclaimed, let our hearts receive that which you have prepared for us today. Open our hearts and our minds to hear you and to learn from you. Amen. Today's scripture reading is 2 Samuel chapter 11. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah, but David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, This is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, Send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house, and there followed him a present from the king. Bariah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, You have just come from a journey. Why did you not go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark of Israel and Judah remains in booths, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house, to eat and to drink, and to lie with my wife? As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, Remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence, and made him drunk. In the evening he went out to lie on his couch with the servants of his lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning David wrote a letter to Joab, and sent it by the hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, Set Uriah in the forefront of the hardest fight, and then draw back from him, so that he may be struck down and die. As Joab was besieging the city, he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew there were vigilant warriors. The men of the city came out and fought with Joab, and some of the servants of David among the people fell. Uriah the Hittite was killed as well. Then Joab sent and told David all the news about the fighting, and he instructed the messenger, When you have finished telling the king all the news about the fighting, then, if the king's anger rises, and he says to you, why did you go near the city to fight? Did you not know they would shoot from the wall? Who killed Abilemic, son of Jeribal? Did not a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead too. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. The messenger said to David, The men gained an advantage over us, and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. David said to the messenger, 
Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this matter trouble you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Press your attack on the city and overthrow it, and encourage him. When the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When my boys were little, they played all the time with my best friend's son. They were all the same age. There's one day we were visiting my friend's father who had a lot of land, a big backyard. The boys ran around all day. And at one point during the day, we gave them slices of watermelon, big slices. And as you can imagine, by the end of their snack, they were covered in watermelon juice, sticky fingers, sticky clothes. They were a mess. And since they were outside, we told my friend's dad, just go ahead and hose them down. Let them take off their clothes and hose them down. He looked at us with a question on his face. You mean all the way down to their skivvy drawers? Yes, all the way down to their skivvy drawers. The boys ran around in their underwear and waited till they got dry again. To some, it's called skivvy drawers. Others, underwear. For some, underclothes. And for some people, unmentionables. Whatever we call the items we wear under our clothing, most of us agree that we don't want anybody to see them. We want to keep them private, close to our skin. We don't want anybody to see our unmentionables. Now the same is true for life events. There are some things we'd prefer to keep to ourselves. Things we have done that we'd never like to show to others. Unmentionables. Now, King David had a terrible episode in his life, one he surely wished to remain unmentioned. We just read the story. David, the one called a man after God's own heart, gave in to a horrendous temptation, and he had committed adultery, he coveted, he lied, and he murdered. Now, let's start with Bathsheba. I've always seen paintings and drawings of Bathsheba bathing on her roof in plain sight of David, who watched from his own roof. But I was wrong. The scripture clearly says something different. It says, it happened late one afternoon when David rose from his couch and was walking around on his roof. He saw from his roof a woman bathing. Now at this time and place in history, people bathed in a court courtyard of their homes, a hidden place surrounded by trees and shade. Now, as I was reading articles about this scripture, would you believe that some people were commenting that Bathsheba was to blame for this whole thing because she was bathing in plain sight? But that is just not true. She was bathing in a courtyard while David watched from above. Now, honestly, who is immune to, from the temptation of looking at a beautiful person without clothes? Some of us resist that temptation. 
but David did not. His peaking turned to coveting, which turned into wielding his power to take Bathsheba and have relations with her. This is no doubt a piece of David's life that he would have liked to remain unmentioned. Now, what followed this was a continuation of David's sin. Once Bathsheba's pregnancy was announced, he tried to kill her husband, Uriah. He tried several times. And when Uriah's moral character remained steadfast, David arranged for Uriah's death in the battlefield. But David tried to hide this. He wanted it to be hidden, just like our skivvy drawers, our underwear, our underclothes, or our unmentionables. Now, I'm not so unlike David in this part of his life. I've had things I wish I could hide. I imagine you do too. I don't know if I've told you this story before, but once when I was in middle school, our church youth group was going to Six Flags. Now you have to understand that this was my first trip with the youth group. And I was so excited to drive all the way to Six Flags. Now there was a boy in our youth group, our same age named John. John had never been to Six Flags. In fact, he'd never really been anywhere. He worked very hard to mow people's lawns and to do chores, to save money for this trip. But to my group of middle school girls, we thought John was a little weird. He wasn't like the other boys. Yet, because he didn't have any friends, he decided to come with us, with me and my girlfriends. You know, to a middle school mind, that was horrifying. And then what we did was even more horrifying. We entered the park. We asked him to sit by the fountain right near the carousel. And we said, we're going to go to the restroom. We'll be right back. Wait for us. And then we went to the restroom and we snuck behind it and went on our merry way. At the end of the day, when we all met up again, the whole youth group ready to, to get on the bus, John was still there in that place. The rule was we couldn't go anywhere by ourselves. And he obeyed and he stayed there alone. I hid that for years. And then one night as I was working with middle school kids in the youth group, and I'd been talking with the girls as an adult, as an adult youth leader, I was talking with the middle school girls about how mean they had been to another youth group meeting to another member of the youth group. I was talking to them how, about how unkind they were being. And then that memory of Six Flags hit me. And I realized I needed to air out my unmentionables. Now, afterwards, I shared that story I told the girls what I had done. Their response was something akin to Miss Anna that was so mean. I responded, yes, yes, it was mean. And I am embarrassed to have hurt somebody so harshly. Now, because of that admission, our conversation turned to how the girls might make amends with their friend who they were mean to, and to ask them for forgiveness. I did the same thing. 
years later, I asked John for forgiveness. Now, the end of our reading today has one simple sentence. What David had done displeased the Lord. I have done many things that, have, that displeased the Lord. What can I do about it? What did David do about it? Well, God sent the prophet Nathan to speak to David. He told David that God knew what he had done. He told David that God was displeased with his actions. And David agreed. He said, I have sinned against the Lord. Then Nathan gave David these words. The Lord has taken away your sin, but there will be grave consequences. And there were. Repentance is the key here. It's important. Mentioning the unmentionables is important because it is in that act of repentance that we recognize our need for forgiveness. Now, the night after I shared with those middle school girls what I had done to John at Six Flags, that night I prayed intensely. I don't think I slept much at all that night because I needed to talk to God about my sin. Now, after Nathan spoke to David, he did the same thing. He needed to talk to God and he wrote a beautiful Psalm, Psalm 51. And David named it this, a Psalm of David, when the prophet Nathan came to him after he had gone into Bathsheba. This is Psalm 51, and it reads in part, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, Lord, you alone have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified in your sentence and blameless to pass judgment. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and put a new and right spirit within me. I can certainly relate to David's cry, to his song, and I desire to be washed, to be stainless and fresh, just like fresh, untouched snow. I want a clean heart, and I know that God indeed can and will do that for me. Now, I want to ask you, look at your life. Can you find some unmentionables? Can you think back and discover something that you have hidden close to your heart, close to your skin? That needs to be aired out. That needs to be given to the Lord to be cleaned. We all do have unmentionables. We all do. But the good news is this. When we take these to God, we find that God washes away our sin through Jesus Christ, our Savior. And we find ourselves new, new with one another and with God. Given, our chance, given ourselves a chance to live in a new way that pleases God, which is what David did. From there forward, yes, he made mistakes, but nothing as terrible as this episode in David's life. 
He was forgiven and he was given a new chance. He was cleaned up. Think about your unmentionables. Pray about them. Confess them. Let the Lord wash out your unmentionables and all of God's washed children said, Amen. Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bees me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come. I as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of wonder blood to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot holy of God I come I May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.